Um, I think to your point, a lot of people have this notion that like, it just doesn't make sense that we have in a modern economy with technology enabled options, this weird ancient thousands year old binary of own or rent seems absurd, especially when renters are often paying more per square foot than a, a homeowner in the same market and getting zero return on their gross income, which often well exceeds 30% and even 50% of their gross income. That is absurd. And you always feel like a renter, like you're getting screwed. Welcome to episode 30 of People Are The Answer. I truly believe that people are the only answer to the world's many problems. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, a serial entrepreneur, here to learn how innovators are creating outsized transformational social impact. Today's episode features Dr. Michael Barnes. A passionate and compassionate entrepreneur, Michael went from being a teacher to starting and exiting an ed tech company to investing and advising startups. He's now building Viva, which lets renters invest in exchange for being good tenants. Michael and I discuss his journey from teacher to founder, exiting teacher talent, starting Viva, and his incredible learnings along the way. Here is Michael Barnes on People Are the Answer. Michael, thank you for joining me on People Are the Answer. Glad to be here and, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, if you could just start off by telling our listeners uh, who you are, you know, where you're based and what your current role is. Yeah. So my name is Michael Barnes. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Viva. We're helping renters build wealth to address uh, gaps in wealth and affordability of housing and uh, location. I spend time uh, between Austin, Texas and South Texas, where I have a lot of family. And uh, but we do have a distributed team. So I like to say I'm anchored in Austin, not necessarily based. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. I like that. Um, and in general, what would you say motivates you? I'm definitely motivated by, uh, and this is true since high school, a desire to, as corny as it sounds, you know, make the world a better place and really to know that the impact I'm having in my work is making a material difference in the lives of others. And I fundamentally believe that we've kind of awakened to this world or arrived in this world. And there's a lot of systems that are um, not only suboptimal, but in many cases, um, parasitic, right? There's a lot of people out there perpetuating harm, but at the end of the day, I think there is needless suffering. And if we can create better systems to eliminate, um, some of the, the struggle that people go through, then that will put us to a, a place where we can actually enjoy the world. So I hope at the end of my career to better enjoy the world because we've helped make it a little bit better for everyone. I love that and certainly appreciate those motivations. Uh, very good sort of roundup of what I'm going here for here with this show is just people that are trying to make the world as better as they can and making it a better place for all of us. So I thank you for that. Um, you know, where did you grow up and what was it like there? Yeah, so I grew up all over the country. I lived in, I think, six states by the time I was 12. Um, wow. I was born in, yeah, exactly. I was born in Silver Springs, Maryland. I lived in Florida, Georgia, Texas, New Jersey, and upstate New York um, for, for different stints. And people often ask, you know, is your dad a, in the military or something like that? Um, not sure why it couldn't be my mom. But uh, <laughs> the, the answer is actually no, that my um, stepdad was in uh, apartment housing, right? Multifamily housing, that he was a property manager, then an asset manager, and he would kind of move to different. Um, moved to different uh, urban areas based on his work. So um, once he and my mom met when she was in law school at the University of Florida in uh, Gainesville, uh, Florida, then we went to Atlanta, Georgia, Dallas, Texas, Austin, Texas, and back to Atlanta. And the funny thing is when I graduated high school from Marietta High School in Atlanta, uh, near Atlanta, Georgia, um, my parents never moved again. So. <laughs> So of all the course. moving was 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 just during uh, childhood growing up, but I actually liked it. I, I thought it was an opportunity to kind of reinvent yourself. When people talk about childhood, they often think about all the sort of trauma that would aggregate around them in the little niches and cliques of, of their school. Well, when you move, you get a chance to just leave all that behind and, and say, who am I going to be in this new place? And there's a kind of uh, positive process of reinvention there. So. Yeah, that, that's a really good perspective on that. Um, I think that could be something that'd be great for, for some children, for sure. And 
Um, so you said you went to, to high school in the Atlanta area. So were you able to go for all four years there? Or? Yeah, no, actually. So the first two years were in uh, Austin, Texas or nearby. I was in Round Rock, Texas. Um, and the funny thing is, I was very um, committed to sort of um, expressing my ambition through speech and debate because that was a big thing in Texas. And I went to nationals and stayed and attained these statuses as a sophomore that were like pretty, pretty far along. And I would compete in like five events per tournament. Um, and even though I wanted to be a very serious debater, I was actually best at improv, like really humorous impromptu performances. So even my like desire and what I was actually good at had an interesting divergence. But then when I moved to Atlanta, uh, I tried to like create a debate club and that didn't go well. Um, I ended up going into theater, obviously a pretty strong correlation, um, but it basically just went deep in a different channel for my junior and senior year. In my junior year in Marietta High School, we were in a hundred year old school um, that literally I went to a theater class in a basement of a building and uh, picked up a book and dusted it off. And it was a 1917 history book. It was like a legit history book where you open to the last page and it's like, hopefully Wilson will prevail or something like World War One had not been concluded. Wow. Um, and then my senior year, we were in a brand new high school. So I had a lot of different experiences in high school. Yeah. That's fascinating. And where did that end up taking you to college? Yeah. So I ended up uh, going to McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, in part because they have uh, strong values around service and commitment to social impact, as well as internationalism. One of their most uh, well-known alumni is Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations. And even though they're a small school with a total student body of, of about 2,000 and change, um, they represent more than 80 different countries internationally, and that's part of their point of pride. So it was a great experience and really an opportunity to live out some of these desires for impact through community service, community organizing, political organizing, legislative advocacy, um, working for the city or county of St. Paul uh, and, and, um, and the nearby county. So I basically did a lot of different things that I was able to, to try out and journalism was a big piece of what I did. Got it. Well, it sounds like it was a great spot for you. And, um, you know, what took you from there to getting into teaching? Yeah. So it was, it was super random. Um, again, I was, uh, I guess ambitious, uh, as a college student and wanted to be a journalist. I really felt there was so much power in storytelling to be able to shed light on what people were going through. And a strange thing happened at a small weekly college paper, you know, with a student population of 2000, where if you write a really good story and you share someone's truth with respect and accuracy, people start coming out of the woodworks and bring you stories, right? So um, there were various serious stories of like people being abducted, a, a visiting member of a family got abducted from a white castle and got uh, ended up two weeks later in San Diego across the border from Tijuana, like had been, you know, human trafficking. And I'm talking to U.S. Marshals and I have the hotspot to call the mom in the hotel who's grieving when her daughter's first taken and have that conversation and deal with the ethics of, of why should I? Should I even call a mom whose daughter's just been taken from her? Um, so the, the crazy thing was in this really small community, how many really serious stories would come to you um, and that you'd have the opportunity to explore. The problem was in 2006, when I graduated from McAllister, um, the journalism industry was cratering in terms of its revenues and was hyper competitive um, at the same time, though. So in a creative industry, there was just hyper competitive uh, nature for very limited spots. And so I didn't get one of the prestigious internships. So I was not sure that I wanted to be unstable. My friend who ended up being a journalist went to New York City. And when I was later a teacher, I would fly in and buy him beers because he couldn't afford them, like a dollar beer. Um, and now he works for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he actually wrote the book that helped take down uh, WeWork, which is fun fact. Oh, wow. Um, but for me, I wanted just a little bit more stability. I was like, if I'm going to make impact, I need to have a little bit more coherence to my life. So I, I, out of a lark, I took an option from Teach for America to interview. I was like, why would they pick me? I've, I've got no education training. Apparently, that's their model. And... <laughs> Um, you know, because I'd been student government president and a leader in different contexts at my college, I guess those were the things that they thought would make me a good teacher in their, in their calculus. And I went to um, the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas through Teach for America. I basically deferred until all my other sort of more ambitious options didn't materialize. And I was like, you know what, this makes sense. I'm going to go teach 
um, I'm going to go live out this, this idea of service in South Texas. And that's what I did. Awesome. It's, it's good to see that you followed that path that kind of came your way. I, I did appreciate, though, what you were saying in terms of power and storytelling. It's something I've noticed a lot, especially lately, you know, in this kind of the world that we live in at the moment where it's so hard to maintain people's attention. Sometimes storytelling is the only way to do so, whether that be via film content or books or otherwise. Um, so I agree that's super powerful, but it, it, it's interesting to see how that, you know, ended up leading you into teaching. Well, yeah. And, you know, they say all the world's a stage and, and we are but players. So the idea is um, if you didn't go into theater and act, we're really acting all our lives, right? We're in a context with certain players and we're trying to perform for certain, you know, outcome, um, sales, everything really is its own performative art. And entrepreneurship is very much the same way. You're often talking to audiences, trying to persuade and, and share a story. Um, but to your point, I think the stories that are most important to me are the ones that involve ordinary people who are just trying to go about their life and have a good experience, pursue the quote American dream. And what are the impediments that none of us would anticipate and none of us would want to swap places and endure that they go through? What are the odysseys that happen uh, sort of around the corner every day with, with ordinary folks? Um, but yeah, Teach for America, you know, I, I don't want to sell it short. It was a really great experience. And I've actually worked with the organization in a number of ways over the years. But it was like you're getting dropped into a high poverty, high trauma, historically uh, uh, colonized and, and kind of traumatized region and told to go teach kids and, and, and make their future brighter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My, my sister actually uh, did Teach for America as well. And so I, l I learned a little bit about it firsthand. She was in the DC area and it's um, seems like a, a super impactful program, but yeah, obviously they throw a lot at the participants. Yeah. And, and you sort of say like, oh, I'm ready for this. The hardest thing I've ever done. Sure. And you're like, oh my God, this is so hard. It's like, well, I guess technically I was warned. Um, and yeah, the first year I recall in particular being very uh, difficult. And I've later gone back and trained teachers who've gone through Teach for America in their summer training program um, in two cycles. And so I've actually been that resource trying to coach people and prepare them for that very difficult first year or so. I think for me, what helped was I actually stuck it out really even as part of the experiment of understanding what it's like to be people living in these communities. Can a teacher make a positive impact on students' lives? What makes that difficult? And I did uh, seven years that I spent in the same hallway in Ed Couch, Texas, a rural uh, town uh, in South Texas in the frontera near the borderlands with Mexico. Got it. That's, that's super interesting. So at what point in this process did you start working on social impact apps? Yeah, I, what happened was I, uh, my birth father was um, in the uh, army. He was a ranger and served uh, in Vietnam and he passed away and they determined um, that his death could have been the result of military wounds. So I had survivor's benefits from the VA, which I'm, I'm grateful for that privilege. And then also some grant money from Teach for America. And combined, I was um, given an opportunity to pursue a master's degree with kind of a clock. If I didn't use certain benefits by a certain time, they would run out. And so I uh, went to the university nearby where I was teaching in South Texas. The University of Texas Rio Grande Valley is, is now what it's called. And I literally went through the entire catalog and I was like, what do I want to do? Um, and part of the thing is that in college, I'd wanted to double major in like physics and uh, political science, which I just had a, a yearning for the hard sciences since I was a kid, just a fascination. And uh, when I ultimately gave up on the physics double major, because that was a bit of a stretch, I wanted to, to go back to the hard sciences. I kind of wanted to prove, to be honest, there's this sense of like social sciences aren't real and real intelligent people <laughs> pursue hard sciences. So I really wanted to scratch a hard science. And I looked at the computer science program uh, for my master's and they were one of those programs that was accepting people who didn't necessarily come from a CS background, but I had to take like um, a test course um, in my first semester um, to basically learn programming. Um, and I'd done some like minor programming in high school on an obsolete language, Pascal. Um, so I just said, let's go with it, right? Let's go for it. And they were very welcoming and supportive. And uh, in that first class, I did all the extra credit and got like 120 in the class or something. So um, I did well. And that teacher became my advisor. Um, and that was C++, which is not as relevant a language yep. for a lot of the apps you build. 
But basically, once I went into computer science and kind of attained the sight of, of computer science, which is about logic, it's about breaking problems down to discrete components and coming up with finite answers to problems, right? Uh, and sort of a systematic way to solve things. I kind of looked around at a lot of the people that I knew, nonprofits, um, uh, city leaders, school leaders. And I realized like, oh, you're getting screwed left and right because of your lack of awareness. We'll call it ignorance, right? Your lack of awareness of technology. People are exploiting that. They're, they're predators that say, oh, the fact that you don't know about tech means I can deliver half the quality at twice or three times the price. And I just went around like, oh, you know, you're getting screwed and you could get twice, uh, you know, better quality at half the price. And eventually someone was like, well, then do it for me. And I was like, fine, I will, you know, sort of like a gauntlet was thrown down. And I started uh, putting together teams where I would just kind of be the architect and uh, quarterback the situation and help pull together talent to solve hardware, software, networking, uh, app building, website creation, all kinds of problems uh, for municipalities and nonprofits uh, for fun. That that does sound like fun and it sounds super helpful. I'm sure that they were very happy to have you. Um, it, it, and didn't this somehow start off as a newspaper project? Yeah, you've probably had this situation where like when you suddenly need a business entity, you just grab the one that's on the shelf, right? Yeah. And so when I got to Ed Couch, Texas, I still did some writing for my college alumni magazine and some other publications because I still had the journalist bug. I still intended to be a journalist. Um and so the idea was I would create a local paper and there's a lot of mandatory ads that need to be served up in some sort of paper of record. And the idea was I would go like compete for these like mandatory ads as a source of revenue to justify good journalism. That actually ends up being a pretty political process. Like there's a lot of um, compadres and backslapping that determine where those ads go. So as a business, it never really took off. And then my momentum as a teacher made it hard for me to also become, you know, publisher of a of a paper of record in the municipality. So basically that one just like died from lack of um, sustained effort and, and financial opportunity. And uh, when I started doing these projects and needed a business entity, I just grabbed the, the Ed Couch and also Citizen, which was like the name of the two towns uh, was the paper name. But then actually I, uh, I went ahead and just like, that's kind of like me, hey, I'm that guy. And so I was the one going around solving problems. Got it. That's awesome. Um, it, it sounds like you've you've gone about life, you know, kind of finding your passions and finding the things that you can help fix with them. And uh, I can certainly appreciate that. Yeah, I think education. I love educators. I have a heart for everyone who's out there sort of on the front lines working with children. I would say it's the job that is both rewarding because you're actually trying to move you know, children and their families by association forward, like literally in the hardest way, one step at a time, especially when you're facing a lot of the trauma of poverty contexts, a lot of um, broken homes and, and drug use and things that just compound problems. And um, there's also a lot of beauty, a lot of really uh, brilliant and uh, inspiring people and artistic young people and, and amazing families that were very supportive of their children's education. So there's just like the whole nexus of, of good, bad, and difficult. But it was one of those jobs that tax you mentally, physically, and emotionally in a way that I think uh, nothing else can. It kind of prepares you to do anything else with relative ease. And uh, my heart goes out to teachers who are still sort of on the front lines. I did it for seven years. Um, so, so a bit of a veteran, but didn't stick it out for a lot of people who honestly, I, I, I admire. Um, now that's impact. The question is this, this premise of can I create some sort of scalable impact? Can I now create impact that goes beyond, you know, um, throwing another starfish in the ocean, helping another student learn to read? I actually don't know that many people have proven that thesis, to be honest, because when you go out and think, oh, I'm going to go help make the world a better place. I'm going to pick up a hammer for Habitat for Humanity. I'm going to fundraise for this thing. When you get down to it, it's hard to show in many cases that you're creating impact at scale. And there's a lot of organizations that have, I've learned, nonprofits and others that have kind of political aspects to them where, you know, it's not a joyful place to be. There's, you know, kind of toxic personalities that are monopolizing funding sources and the funding sources ultimately don't have rationally to do with the projects that they're funding. So, so I think that's the challenge that I learned uh, once I left um, teaching was uh, I partly learned in college, but learned a lot more when I left teaching that it's really hard to just go out there and, and quote, make the world a better place. 
Yeah, yeah, it truly is. I mean, like you said, impact's hard to measure. There's there's so many competing uh, wants and desires from those that are behind the scenes at, at a lot of these organizations. So um, in is that what led you to go ahead and start your own company? Yeah, I think I was just joyful. I think there was a lot of optimism, like, okay, actually, the, the, the truth is my master's in computer science, I... Um, completed by solving some problems around a piece of technology that is downright creepy, right? Which is uh, DNA self-assembly, which is teaching DNA, like actual DNA from your body, organic or synthesized in a lab to turn itself into computational devices. So you basically like program, you'd manipulate the DNA and you'd put it in the solution. And what does DNA do? It reproduces, right? And it would start replicating into these computational structures that could create like millions of copies of these sort of like nanobots, right? Right. And so the the crazy thing was thousands of researchers who'd pursued this field had never really asked like, well, what are we creating? Like, what is the actual like use case of these things? And when I won a prize, um, these defense contractors came and were very eager to like offer jobs and talk about like lucrative opportunities. And so you start to think like invisible, organic computers, that maybe your body wouldn't reject. Like there's some really creepy stuff you could theorize as a, a researcher if you actually like brought this to application. So part of me was like, am I building Terminator um, in, in one fashion or another? And these um, DNA uh, robots, if you will, were Turing universal, which meant theoretically they could replicate anything and everything that an actual computational device could. It's just a matter of can we commercially and viably build it yet in a consistent way, um, the manufacturing process. So that was like too much for my brain to take. In fact, the last two pages of my master's thesis, which I kept online, are a warning, like on the ethical side, like beware, this comes with an ethical warning label. Um, and so the idea of like going to Austin for my PhD, which is really an excuse to like step back from teaching, because to be honest, it was overwhelming when my pay was frozen for five straight years. Now I have a family. <clears throat> um, I have kids. Um, it is emotionally draining and very difficult to say maybe as an isolated node in the bottom of a system with all the adults getting in the way, the politics of a system, maybe I'm not going to be able to be the change agent that my students deserve. So let me step back and get perspective on this problem. You can always go back to teaching in theory, but let me step away and, and stay fresh and not lose my own sense of optimism. And, um, and so the idea of going from like creepy Terminator science or teaching in schools to like, hey, let's just create an app. To me, that was like a sandbox. That was so much easier to say, let's just create a social app and see if we can create positive influences in the world. Um, that was the premise. I'm going to go to Austin. I'm going to be doing this PhD program, which is an excuse to like reflect on education, but also I'm going to be building social impact apps. So while you were getting your PhD, you're, you're doing this app building. Yeah, I, I, that was the busiest time of my life. I also, to pay the bills, ran a charter school for a while. So, you know, I, I did wow. a few things. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it was a really busy time. I'm sure it was fulfilling, though. It was. It was very fulfilling. Again, actually, a tremendous amount of impact. That charter school, for example, was in the early stages of creation, and those things are crazy and chaotic in that phase. Um, and it was kind of like, could this institution be a force for good for students, or could it be a sham? And I think we successfully worked in a two-year period to make it a, a success for students. Many of the teachers that I helped retain and, and keep in that school are actually still there more than a decade later as teachers and leaders. It's a rare instance of, I think, a really good community that, that sort of tried to meet its mission. So that, that's, that's cool to hear. And it must be nice to look back on that school and, and see kind of where it is today. Well, yes, exactly. And the app that I ended up taking out of the UT Austin uh, startup scene and taking to Techstars, Teacher Talent, is predicated on the work that I discovered and learned how to do for that charter school, which is where I discovered that there were like no good solutions to finding talent in education, that all the leading market leading applications looked like they were made in the 1980s. They were terrible and they had horrible features like felons were not prevented from joining the job board. And you would have these people with disclosed child related felonies applying to be teachers and you were terrified that like you'd miss one and they would get sent to a principal, right? So th that was like the status of the stuff that I used when helping this charter school get off the ground. And 
so it actually led us on a pathway to discovering a rich problem space in which to build an app. So sometimes your distractions and your compromises actually become opportunities. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's a, certainly a positive way to look at it. And so the concept for teacher talent started within your schoolwork? Um, yeah, it, it, it basically, we were building an app and we actually created an application that won a, a couple of prizes and some in a small amount of money. It seemed like a lot to us back then. We, we had like five grand and seven grand in checks, these like nominal amounts. But to us as like, you know, noobs, it was a lot. And we created an application, actually it's pretty cool, called Forever Card that would um, allow you to scan any business card. Um, but more importantly, once you input a contact in your phone, like your iOS app, uh, then it would auto sync. So like if you went and changed jobs or changed emails, it would auto update my contacts to match. So you never have to like get someone's new email or get someone's new number or like change your data. It was, it was once you connected, you were forever connected. That's the idea. Um, and even if you like change your data, it would then populate throughout the network. So you would be able to curate what data your network has. Um, and uh, that was a really cool app. We actually were just terrible at understanding how to like monetize that effectively and didn't want to just like charge right. consumers. Um, and we had limited independent resources. So we actually just kind of like let it idle and eventually um, decay. Um, and someday we'll probably like build it again for like marketing purposes. Um, but what we did is take kind of the back end contact knowledge and say, what are we going to do now with this, with this technology? Oh, wait, here's this really hairy problem where schools can't find talent and I can just like use this to start aggregating contact data, not for your network contacts, but for a network of teachers. Yeah. And so I know you, you joined Techstars. Where was teacher talent at the time that you joined Techstars? Yeah. So uh, my timeline is I graduated college in 2006. I went to Austin in 2013. Um, dabbled in all the things I discussed for about two years until maybe 2015, at which point I'd also completed all my uh, PhD coursework, this sort of core coursework. And in 2015 and 16, I um, you know bought a house, grew my family, and actually was like trying not to be an entrepreneur because I was like, that seems really irresponsible. Right? So I was trying to like get a better, more stable job. And it didn't really pan out. And I kept getting these contracts to solve problems in tech. Um, and teacher talent was in 2015, when I left the charter school, the charter school became customer zero. They became the first customer for the new app. So I had like one customer um, and we were able to pilot some of the technology. And then from 2015 to 2016, I had word of mouth demand from other friends who were like, I went this for my charter school in Colorado. Can you do this for us? So we kind of grew to like two, then four early customers just organically, but it was still a project more than a company. And I had a team that was helping me service all these other contracts I'd gotten instead of jobs, you know, um, and that portfolio, I was kind of pitching as a company, but it was messy, right? It was like, in your mind, you saw it as something coherent, but it was really just a jumble of, of projects. And we kind of came to this conclusion um, in January of 2017, that uh, we needed to wipe away all the projects that were not going to be long-term fruitful so that my team could focus on one thing. And we chose the one thing which was actually generating the least revenue at the time, which was teacher talent, right? And so from our uh, one, two, and now four customers, we basically said, okay, how do we scale this out and grow this? And uh, you know, between March and June of 2017, we engaged and got accepted into Techstars. And that's you know, when we, you know, really took off on the, the classic founder journey. Yeah. I mean, I, it's cool to see that there was this problem that you decided to tackle, you know, even though it wasn't generating the most revenue, it, I, I assume it must've seemed like the most pressing need. Yeah, definitely a huge need. So uh, it's still true that um, teacher churn is a huge problem in the industry. We were trying to address the fact that 8% of teachers are leaving the entire profession every year. Another 8% are shifting between schools. And our goal was if you get the right talent in the building, they will make the school better and also create a more stable environment that will lead to reduction in churn, right? If you stabilize the environment, it's not destabilized, less people are quitting every year and you've got a good long-term entity. It actually is true that that's the work that we achieved at the, the charter school system that I worked with in East Austin. That's where it is today. A lot of the people that I knew a decade ago are still there. And that is 
rare but impressive success. And so we're trying to take yeah. the same thesis to the entire industry um, and you know, ended up working with more than 50 schools across 10 states. So certainly there's a lot of demand for the, the problem. Um, the one thing I will say as an early founder, because you're kind of just like a bloodhound with a scent and you're following a trail, is that we didn't, we weren't as critical about the fact that this sector, as, as investors like to say, is um, starved of financial resources, right? So like when you're trying to fund right. a company at scale, you feel bad charging schools, you feel worse charging teachers, where's yeah. the money coming from? I will say to early founders, a lot of the challenges, sometimes they're just in a tough market. And that means that they're trying to like do a normally difficult thing, but with an incline that's, that's near impossible. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point when you're targeting customers that don't have the resources that you necessarily need. Um, you, you hope that you find partners and investors that understand the goals and why you're doing this and why it's so important. And I, I imagine that would be a big part of it. Yeah, and we and we lucked out because we did pick the part of the school organization that doesn't have much choice. They can't not hire. So it's a right. reactive space where we didn't want them to think reactively. We wanted them to think proactively. But at the end of the day, they had to be reactive and say, I'm mandated by the state of whatever to have a teacher who's certified in this classroom to teach this class. I have to hire. I therefore have to allocate resources to finding people. So we did find a piece of that mechanism. But even then, it wasn't um, it wasn't as robust as like uh, tech hiring, right? Uh, a tech bounty on a hire can easily be 20% of a salary well in excess of $100,000. That's sort of 20K per success case. In education, it was ambitious to get it to 10% of a salary that might be at $50,000, right? So you're taking a 20K bounty for success against 5K for success in education. So already right there, you're like at 25% of the, the financial resources. Yeah. Yeah, that, that certainly makes it tough. Um, I'm curious, you know, how was your time at Techstars? Was that pivotal for your business? Um, yeah, Techstars is an amazing program. I think one of the challenges is this assumption and accelerator that every single business is literally, if you've ever seen a hockey stick growth curve model, the hockey stick is this really long period of time of like try, a little bit of success, struggle over and over again. And then in theory, you hit an inflection point where you're at the end of the hockey stick where now you're just going to shoot up to the moon. And the presumption that a bunch of early stage companies all happen to be at exactly the same point in a really long journey. So like in the life cycle of a business, that hockey stick part can be like seven years easily, five to seven years easily. So the probability that a dozen or 20 different companies will all happen to be at their inflection point at the exact same time is probably unlikely. So I think part of the premise is if you assume that, if you assume that you're at the inflection point and not in an earlier part of the stick, you're going to make decisions that may actually not be optimal for your journey. So I do think that there's kind of a, an accelerator presumption that can create harm for companies that aren't savvy enough to kind of resist some of those assumptions. And we were we were noobs. So I think we just kind of bought into the methodology. We went as hard as we could. And also um, one thing is when you are at Techstars, they have something called um, investor and mentor whiplash, where you talk to like 100 different investors and potential mentors who aren't necessarily specific to your sector or specific to your problem. So the probability that they're going to be particularly invested from the get is really small. We had a lot of people just say, love you, love your story, love what you're doing. We don't touch education with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> like, so you're getting shot down in the first 10 seconds. Um, and, um, and I think that can be a little bit difficult. We still endured it. We're like, whatever, let's go. We, had, we were fearless. We were um, you know, hyped. And we managed to achieve a, a great amount of success and got a lot out of Techstars. It's a great program. But now the way that I do things is much more about, and I coach founders, much more about, you know, use relational networks to find people who are already passionate about adjacent spaces that you're working in or the space you're working in. And you're going to have really great conversations that are fruitful, regardless of whether they invest or not, you're going to get a lot of valuable information. And the probability that they invest is a lot higher if you're already pulling on a thread that they're passionate about, um, though sometimes people can surprise you. So uh, one of our biggest mentors um, for Viva is actually, so Viva is about real estate and, and helping renters build wealth. So it's sort of like FinTech meets PropTech. But one of our biggest mentors is actually um, the, the co-founder and chairman of Indeed, the hiring platform. I, I first approached him around teacher talent, but he's kind of bored, I think, of like lead gen for hiring. Like you've been doing that for a decade. That's your whole life. You want something different. He's very passionate about you know, 
um, real estate innovation, and he happens to be an LP in a lot of uh, uh, you know real estate funds. So I think there's some scenarios there where it's like, wait a second, what you think somebody might be passionate about might be different. But at the end of the day, you're probably safer going with people that are closer to your orbit instead of 100 random people. Um, don't just talk to random investors. Probably not a good use of your time. That, that makes sense. I think that's good advice for, for people working in the space. Um, so what was the timeline from going into Techstars to when you eventually sold the business? Yeah, so we were, um, I think the thing for me in startups that I can say is that every day I feel like slow and kind of dumb because I see the future and it's bright and it's crystal clear. It's better than a television. I can see it clearly and it's right there and you can just almost reach it. And then every day you're falling dramatically short of getting to that future, right? Oh, I, I know that feeling for sure. I have uh, I have a quote on my taped up to my monitor that every journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step because, you know, I often can see that big vision at the end, but it, it can be a, a drag a little bit sometimes on the day to day. Yeah. And, and this time around and at this point in my life, I'm better able to just kind of like lean into even feeling a little bit like, meh, like, well, I didn't really kill today. Like, you know what? It's okay. I'm going to take a nap because ironically, what we did in Techstars uh, in teacher talent in our first journey, from first venture money in tech stars in June of 2017 to exit was October of 2018, which July, August, September, October. Okay, so uh, 16 months from start to finish was really fast. So at the same time that we felt like dumb and slow, in the end, we ended up being really fast and efficient and capital efficient. So there's no correlation between how you feel about your progress on a journey and whether you're actually gonna unlock a really complicated puzzle and when, which is a lot like research, especially in hard sciences. Like you either prove something or you don't. And there's a whole lot of time spent just like, you know, banging your head against a metaphorical brick wall, trying to like, trying to like innovate around a problem situation. So um, yeah, so, so we actually left Techstars, like we dipped for a week or two in the middle of the program because we were so um, bullish that we went to uh, Palo Alto and, and Silicon Valley and did a fundraise for a million bucks um, and created FOMO. And we had some issues in our data that we discovered while we were out there. And so we actually had to like pull back from like a million dollar, really aggressive seed round. We ended up raising a few hundred thousand dollars instead. And there was just like a whole lot of like opportunity, but also just like, um, moving fast and breaking things. And you don't even understand what's going on because you're going so fast. So there was just like a lot of like classic startup chaos in the late half of 2017. And then we were burning too much. We were spending too much money. We like thought it'd be clever to get like a WeWork office and to get like a corporate apartment across the street and to like live and work in the same place. But like the amount of things we were spending were probably not like necessary. So we were kind of burning a little bit heavy. And then when you hadn't solved the problem by the turn of 2018, then you experience like down, you know, um, downshifting, right? The scent doesn't feel as joyful where uh, now you're not bringing in the revenue you thought you were. You didn't close as much money as you thought you would. Now you're going to lay off some people to cut burn. And you still haven't solved some of these core problems. Um, and, and our problem was um, we're actually brilliant at identifying pretty much every teacher in America from a, um, aggregation of public and other data sources, and even like identifying a subset of every, you know, certified special educator in the state of Illinois for a customer, and even engaging them with marketing to get them eager and active. And that right there, like sourcing data for an entire sector, um, identifying them with, with certainty, and then marketing them and engaging them is already like a massive value prop that would be big enough to feed like four or five, or even a dozen businesses if this was like hiring in tech. But we didn't have all those like ecosystem partners. So we were like alone in doing this work from like raw data to engaged leads. And we and we crushed it. And then we would hand it off to the school. And we started out using this bounty method where uh, we weren't going to get that 5Gs or whatever the equivalent was until some bureaucrat decided to do something. And we just couldn't believe that we would They'd be like, we have nobody we can hire for special education in the state of Illinois. And we get like a hundred people who are ready to talk to them and they don't do anything. All they do is they like take our email list and spam the people that we'd already like individually warmed up. And we're like, yeah, it was like nuke. So and, frustrating. Yeah, so I, frustrating. I mean, yeah. That tends to be the experience, unfortunately, working with government entities in my experience. 
Yes, and they would lie. They would say that they called all the teachers. So we use like Twilio to mask the teacher's cell phone numbers, both for privacy, but also to monitor the traffic. Uh, and we'd be like, no, you did it. Our data shows that you didn't yeah, call oh any of God. them, right? And like, there were some early emails where I'm like literally tattling to an assistant superintendent on their staff. Like, why are they not doing their job? Um, Man. So it's like the irony of being like brilliant operators doing something magical and bring like magical beans to an industry and then hitting a brick wall and dying and not having the the runway to clearly like impatiently solve these problems. Um, it was, it was, it was absurd and difficult. Um, and, and maybe you see it already, but what we didn't see at the time, because it would have been another innovation on top of innovation was um, ultimately saying, actually, the fact that we brought these people to your doorstep is a service. It's called lead gen. And we're going to start charging you based on lead gen, what we've already accomplished. And if you decide to waste those leads, that's your problem. In fact, if you decide to waste those leads, we're going to step in to do your job for you at a 10x premium, right? So what we started to do is say like, okay, here's your people. Hey, we noticed in the last two weeks, you haven't engaged them and they're falling off and quitting your process. Maybe you should let one of our callers step in and do a 30 minute call that we record with your criteria and recommend for promotion to a final interview at instead of $50 a lead, $500 a lead, right? Yeah. Like, right. So, so we did, we Makes did kind of, of sense. Yeah. But, but it's by like the we time just have to do your job for you, right? <laughs> yes. Now, by the time I figured that out, I really had conviction behind it because even members of my team were pulling against these, these, these price model innovations. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had a co-founder breakup that I think was you know, part of some of that early friction. It wasn't until June and July of 2018 now just about 60 days before our exit that I finally said, I think we should switch to lead gen pricing. I have this conviction. I told my investors in an email, it was like this fateful email. I'm like, most people would quit by now. Um, Maybe I should, but I'm not going to. And here's why, and here's what I'm going to do. And we're going to go for it. Right. And then we, we raised a a chunk of money off that premise um, just enough to kind of execute the experiment. Um, We raised about a hundred thousand dollars. And in 60 days, we went from zero in monthly recurring revenue. Because the other thing is, on a bounty system, there's no recurring revenue. You're only getting paid when somebody gets hired. And also, schools would not tell us they hired someone. They would try to get, which, bless their hearts, they're trying to save money. But they would, like, hide the fact that they, or, like, deny or say, no, 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 we found them from a different source, you know. Yeah, yeah, they were in your funnel, but we, we we found out elsewhere. So by going to Legion, you could actually have monthly recurring subscriptions of the volume of leads you're providing. So we were able to go from zero in, in MRR to $200,000 in 60 days. And um, it was actually literally like at that point, me and a bunch of contractors. Um, I actually developed shingles, which is an old man disease because of the stress of the upside. Wow. Nobody prepares you for the stress of when you actually hit that product market fit. And now you're like getting a call from your sales partner saying like, I've got a $50,000 uh, uh, a customer today. And you're like, great. Like, how the hell am I going to service that? Right. <laughs> so, um, right. So, so yeah, that was, that was our journey. And it was a, a rocket ship. Uh, that took off with the greatest velocity in the last 60 days, really. Wow, that, that's pretty incredible. You don't hear that a lot about, you know, really figuring things out 60 days before an exit. And, you know, how did that, as much as you're interested in sharing, how much, how did that exit come about? What was that process like for you? Yeah, so um, it really was a factor of, okay, I've solved the problem, but now to build or rebuild to some extent the company and technology to really um, make sure this rocket ship doesn't have leaks and it doesn't blow up in the atmosphere that it can actually like have what it needs to survive. If I go it alone as an operator and rebuild, it's going to be a very strenuous journey. That's going to take a very long time with a lot of risk of a, of a zero outcome of failure still. Right. Um, or an investment partner that was offering six figures of additional investment decided to make an acquisition play, which I'd anticipated the, crazy thing was I'd like, in the midst of all this stress and building, I kind of had this thought that uh, 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 an advisor told me I was, I was like crazy. I was like, no, no, no. I think they're going to offer an acquisition. So I'd already kind of like done the math on the back end side so that if they were to proposition, I could like counter with an answer, um, which is pretty cool. Um, And and it actually doubled from my first assumption. So, so I was even cooler by the time we came to, to negotiation, but what it really amounted to was um, somebody who understands the power of being a legion business in a new industry, right? That isn't familiar with this and understood the legion business and could help 
play into that model and also frankly had the capital to immediately upgrade my ragtag band of starving entrepreneurs. When, when I started in on entrepreneurship, it was actually to like take care of my family. I didn't want to hurt my family for entrepreneurship. But after I'd already taken investment and gotten kind of pot committed, I'd taken my wife's life savings and I'd like, you know, I, I was a starving artist at that point. And to go from that and to actually let your team members have salaries and healthcare and to recruit, you know, the people that you couldn't recruit the day before uh, was, was the most compelling proposition. I ultimately thought it was best for the venture. When you're a founder, you're creating a venture kind of like you give birth to a child. You want to take care of its journey, even if that means saying, okay, I don't have to be the jefe. I don't have to be the chief. I can subordinate myself. Also, frankly, like cash out and have a secured victory for my family. So it's not like I, I didn't lose a thing. But, but I am giving up my, my ownership of this entity to see that it can go um, to its best, um, its best future. Yeah, I think that it sounds like it was a, an astute decision and um, one that made a lot of sense in your situation. Obviously, it, it'll vary for entrepreneurs um, when they, they have those opportunities, but uh, it sounds like they were a great partner and that was quality people, right? Yeah, so that entity was created um, sort of as an acquisition entity, right? So um, to really just take this legion aspect and expand it even beyond education potentially. Um, and uh, yeah, so the premise made sense. I kind of gave you the cards that I had on the table. My investors were very happy, especially because like they pegged us for dead like 60 days before. Yeah. And now they're getting a positive multiple return on their investment. Um, obviously, it was uh, um, materially life changing for me to go from being uh, a teacher, <laughs> just like, you know, starving artist of its own sort to being a starving entrepreneur, um, to now being able to not only replenish my wife's life savings, but really set us on a different path to become an accredited investor, to make seed stage investments, that kind of thing. Um, and really just to not, I don't think I realized this until after that juncture. Um, and I probably took like 30 days from October 15th when the deal closed, when I even told the world, like November 15th, I probably took 30 days to just like keep running with the chaos, but also like find time to decelerate and process. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of fear that I think drove me when I was younger that I wasn't able to acknowledge, right? Am I, am I something you have to prove? Am I good enough? Whatever it is that's driving you. And it kind of let all those fears evaporate when you have a success milestone that is somehow significant enough to you personally. And then you realize going forward, you could be motivated by like none of the fears and hopefully all of the positive motivation, the joy, the hunger, and you're a little bit more maybe patient and even more strategic in your decision-making. Yeah, um, that, so, so that, that, that was my personal genesis. Um, I will say once you hand over the keys to your company vehicle to someone else, it's not yours anymore and you don't get to really criticize how they drive. So, yeah, that's fair. Well, did you walk away feeling like you created the impact you were looking for in educational hiring? I, I did to the, ex not to the full extent, but I, but I, but I know that we solved the problem, right? So it's kind of like, uh, man, imagine like, Fauci and those people that created a vaccine, but did they really solve the whole problem? You know, um, uh, for, for the for the uh, coronavirus, right? You can create a solution, but you know that it's going to take still a while for that solution to germinate and uh, create sort of her herd immunity for the problem across the the globe and, and certainly the country. What I did do is um, I, I used mergers and acquisitions to continue making sure that the intellectual property. Um, and leverage some of my own uh, equity in the ongoing vehicle to make sure that the IP was accessible to the right partners so that that IP has now gone on to support thousands of schools across the country. So to go from like one school in East Austin where I you know, developed this kind of concept in my own experience to 50 schools we were serving as customers um, sort of at our peak across a dozen states to... Uh, thousands of schools across the country benefiting from that IP, whether they know it or not, right? Whether they're aware of teacher talent or who I am is irrelevant, but that they have benefited is a success milestone. And more importantly, I still have the ability um, when I see an opportunity to kind of like aid and support other um, ed tech players in, in using this technology. I don't think the industry has solved the problem, but I have the solution. So if anybody wants to like accelerate the solve, just come talk to me. I've got a team member who'd love to like jump back on that wagon um, and, and help make sure that everyone is uh, getting access to the vaccine for finding the right teacher for your school. So Awesome. Yeah. Good to hear me. I have some people that might be interested in that. So hopefully they're listening. Um, 
Well, the teacher talent journey was awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. And you know, now I want to move on a little bit to some of your current endeavors. Let's let's start off and uh, have you tell us about Radical Equity Fund. Yeah. So as I said, when I uh, became an accredited investor and had capital gains to reconcile, um, I had some tips where if you get a windfall of capital gains, you have about 60 days to park it in um, another entity that you can even direct the funds of, but because you're not receiving that money directly, it kind of absolves you some tax liability. And uh, since I knew that I would want to pay it forward and invest some of my capital gains in other startups, I created the Radical Equity Fund, which became that vehicle um, and, and started by just saying like, let me just get into this world of investing, right? Let me get to the other side of the table. And again, this all is very quick from being like a founder who's broke to now turning around and being able to like theoretically fund your friends in the same ecosystem of social impact um, and especially diverse teams pursuing social impact. I remember um, in mid 2019, I think I went to an event uh, in Austin and told a friend like, oh, I've got a fund. And they're like, what's your thesis? I was like, oh, I need a thesis. Um, <laughs> and, and the thesis ultimately became diverse teams pursuing social impact um, ventures. And, uh, and Teams is broad enough that it doesn't necessarily even have to be a classical venture scale business. If there's an opportunity to create impact, I'll deploy capital. And the model that we ended up creating was one where we would, um, me and, a, and, a, and maybe 20-ish um, of my peers who are operators, software engineers, mentors, everyone who's willing to give at least an hour of their time to each portfolio company pro bono to help them achieve their outcomes. We kind of surrounded people with this talent um, from my network and uh, we would do equity-free advising, which is actually rare, right? Like a lot of people are like, I'll help your company for some shares. I personally do it way more than I should probably. <laughs> no, well, but my rationale was like, if I really want equity in your company, I should, I, I don't know a better way to say it, man up. I'll just use a gendered term. Yeah, invest, like, I right? should. I should write a check, right? Yeah. Pony up. Money talks, bullshit walks. That's, a, that's an old yeah. phrase from South Texas and probably parts elsewhere. And so if I'm not going to write a check, I can't like barter for your equity because that's not what I would want as a founder from the founder perspective. Yeah. Um, and actually probably some of those companies probably should give me some, I, I do give advisors actually equity in my current startup, but they put in like 10 hours a week. Like they're hardworking advisors. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not, um, lulling about, um, and my advisor role is more of like, I think on the two to four hours a month is probably like kind of like peak, you know, over course of six months to a year for founders, um, trying to be like high impact with like relatively modest use of time. And, uh, but if there's something big going on, I'll jump in. Um, the funny thing about advising is I actually think that in most of the companies I advise, I would do worse to spend more time with them. It's almost like if I jumped in, I would not be a net yeah. benefit. My plus minus on the court for them would be, would be abysmal. Um, I, I can, I can certainly relate to that. I mean, for me, I, I am fortunate to see a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, you know, and a lot of different things out there. And I'm, I'm able to give these sort of focused a couple of hours to these various organizations. And I, I like to think that it can be super helpful for them. But if I was the type that was digging in every day, I'd probably want to get like my hands too deep in it and then end up stepping on toes. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a weird thing that I never would have anticipated because as with you, probably most of my experiences in life, I jump in head first and I'm deeply involved. I'd rarely been in a position where I just give like a little bit of in, impact and just it, it works well. And they come back and you see their progress and you kind of like nudge. Yeah. Um, I think one of our mentors, um, the, the, the chairman of Indeed, actually, one of our mentors um, in one of my first conversations about Viva, he just like asked a question and it was kind of like the five finger death punch from Kill Bill. We're like, he asked this question just innocently. And then like days later, the question like buried itself into my mind, like inception. And I just had to be like, oh my God, he's right. We've got to you know, be more B2B focused in our business model. It's like, didn't even push, no pressure, just innocently asked an open-ended question that once asked kind of like uh, opened my eyes to, yeah. to a possibility. Um, that's sort of like somebody who's clearly mastered the art of advising. Sometimes I can be a lot more clunky and, and, and awkward. Um, and I'm just going to like try to do my best and not hold back. Um, I don't want to be so nice that I keep things in my head that are like my strategic read on your company, but I don't want to offend you. That's like the hardest thing for me is like, I like you as a person. I don't know if you're ready for this advice, but if I don't tell you, am I delaying knowledge that could help you on your journey? Yeah, no, that's, that's an important perspective. And 
Um, are, are there any portfolio companies that you're expe especially excited about or want to highlight here? Yeah. So one of the things we are good at is helping. So let's say there's about a dozen companies that we worked intensively with and we would do equity free advising. We would do um, low or no interest founder friendly loans, which is something that I actually experienced in teacher talent where like you're about to die because you're short like 10K and don't know where to get it from. Um, and that is easy because I don't have to think as hard as I would for a seed stage investment. It's almost like if you're in our program, like here you go. If you pay it back on terms, and some people pay it back like in two weeks, some people take a year, that's fine. If you pay it back on terms, then you've built that trust, you've kind of replenished this rolling fund, and now I'm more eager to write a seed stage check than ever before. So, um, and then also we made seed stage investments um, selectively so we could support people we love, help them get to a point where even we have to invest, like by compulsion. And there's there's a couple of companies that like, I parked so much of my free capital in Viva that I'm like, I'm like I, I don't know if I could like, Will I hurt my family if I make a seed stage investment in this company right now? Um, but there is a, there is one company I, I would invest in today that I've yet to invest in. I'll mention them. So here's a few. One is um, Creation Crate. We're really good at helping our dozen portfolio companies get into competitive accelerators where our advocacy or our first $10,000 check or, or $25,000 check, whatever the case is, is enough to get them a lot of follow on capital. So, um, so, so Creation Crate ended up going through TechStars with our uh, support and advocacy as, as, a, as a resource, I think. And um, now they're helping kind of like KiwiKit, but with a different bent. So uh, if you look up Creation Crate, they're doing great. They're out there um, helping STEM education reach the home. Um, my kids love uh, science kits and stuff like that. And that's kind of like that ed tech vertical that I also still had a strength in. Um, another one is... Um, um, Another one is Gardenio. They also went through Techstars Sustainability in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and so they are basically trying to help make sure that everyone has the ability to grow plants in their home, especially edible plants, to reconnect people to food. Like that's very passionate to me and something that I am definitely in, in connection with. So Gardenio has been great. Um, there's one called You Include, right? Which is a newer one. I've been working lately with Div Inc., which supports diverse founders. Since I'm no longer investing as much time in like funding startups since I'm building one. Uh, I've offset a lot of my investment to Div Inc. in Austin. And one of their alumni I'm working with, you include, is basically an engine that is like, they're early stage, but their product is just amazing. And this is a, a black female engineer um, out of UPenn, I think, who uh, built a beautiful product. And I had to tell her like, this is the most polished and ready to go to market product I've seen for an early stage startup, like period. And I can unequivocally say to Techstars as well and others, like this person is like top 1% of 1% of people I've worked with. And they didn't even understand how valuable they were in market. I'm like, you need to go and run with this. And basically right now, um, when you look at like product assisted or product led growth, where the product itself speaks for itself and motivates you to like spread it to others, you can go and drop a, uh, drop a job post into their product right now in like 30 seconds and it'll scan and use AI to identify language that has weight for different populations from a bias perspective, right? Like, is your job post offending women? <laughs> if you don't know, drop it in here and in our free trial, we'll tell you, right? Um, and so, yeah, so I think having, having, um, having a really great tool is, is pretty awesome because again, go test it, go experience it, look at the product. If you like it, you know, click subscribe. And not surprisingly, they've been able to grow very quickly in a matter of weeks in terms of paid customers. So, um, yeah, so, so there are great companies out there and that's very inspiring. I, de I do think that there was a part of me that said, I'm, I would like to go on this journey of raising funds to support these startups. I, I, I only use my money because I hadn't got to that, like cross that threshold where I'm taking other people's money for this purpose. Um, I kind of like partnered with some people on a few different projects. Um, and leveraged resources. But the only thing keeping me from doing that full time is this sense that I still have something left to build. I still want to contribute as a builder. And at a later stage of my life, I definitely tend to go back to like focusing on, on helping more startups through the ecosystem. And I'll still do it on an ongoing basis, advise, invest where I can, uh, and, uh, and also do uh, founder friendly loans. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, all us founders out there certainly appreciate that. Um, 
And you know, so you're talking about wanting to go and build something on your own. You, you started Viva Equity Fund. Um, we, it's come up a few times in conversation, but excited to dig in here. Uh, you know, my kind of layman's understanding of it is that it allows renters to put a portion of their rent into an investment fund in exchange for being a good tenant, right? Boom! There you go. You can you can be our spokesperson. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back and, and copy those words and make sure that they're they're exactly the way we say it. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, how did this idea come about for you? It, honestly, myself having been in real estate investment since college, um, since 2009, you know, it's something I've thought a lot about. You know, obviously, as a landlord, rent is great, but for people that are renting. You know, the idea of throwing money into someone else's pocket when there's homeowners that are putting money into equity, you know, it, it can be tough. And so it, it's, it's something not only have I thought about it, you know, people have come to me with ideas around it. I've seen a few ideas out there. So I'm really curious to learn, you know, kind of where your idea came from and, and what's different about Viva Equity Fund. Yeah, and um, we'll sort of go with like the Facebook. It's it's just Viva now. No, um, so I, I just call it Viva. But I do like the name uh, is premise, right? It's a fund because you're building wealth. It's equity because you're building capital, but also social equity. There's a double entendre there. Um, but for purposes of our, our marketing, we'll just call it Viva. Um, okay. And uh, so so what we do with Viva and where it came from um, is actually in Palo Alto when we were fundraising for for teacher talent, like. You're a startup, you're a bunch of startup founders. You're kind of like for fun, riffing on like random startup concepts all the time. I don't know if you have this experience, you probably do. We just like make up wacky and ridiculous startups or semi-serious yep. and kind of go down the channel for fun. Um, and, you know, hundreds of these, I even maybe had a list years ago where we just like made a list of these things. And oh, yeah, I have plenty of those lists for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and Viva just kind of popped out in one of those moments where... I had been riding with an investor in an Uber and it was just like predicting the future. You're like, okay, cars on demand, which I think still has a great, you know, distance to go in terms of making cities more drivable. You know, finally I saw, cause we'd predicted this, like a parking garage where there were no humans, where self-driving cars just parked themselves, which means you reduce the square footage and the space and you can put them underground and have green stuff on top, right? And you could have green cities with little hubs where you walk to go get picked up from cars that only come out when there's demand, right? So like that whole redefining of the future was in vogue in 2017 in mind, and now it's barely coming to fruition. So I thought, why not have housing on demand? Why can't I just go to my app and choose where I live on demand, like an Airbnb, but for my primary residence? But if I'm contributing to this portfolio of housing, this network of housing, I should also get a derivative percentage ownership in the underlying assets. That was the original concept. It was like, I should just see like a mortgage that after every payment I make, my piece of the pie goes up along with everyone else. Um, and, uh, and from that concept, it kind of simmered over several years. Um, I think to your point, a lot of people have this notion that like, it just doesn't make sense that we have in a modern economy with technology enabled options, this weird ancient thousands year old binary of own or rent seems absurd, especially when renters are often paying more per square foot than a, a homeowner in the same market and getting zero return on their gross income, which often well exceeds 30% and even 50% of their gross income. That is absurd. And you always feel like a renter, like you're getting screwed, right? And it's one of the rare industries where because of this stark binary, renters um, love to hate the property managers and landlords they work with and vice versa. It's a rare industry. Like I can't imagine going to Walmart and being like, I paid for my groceries to be like, F you, you know, like who hates the place where they do business? Well, and where you live, like there's just a lot of negativity there. And actually that creates a lot of loss of value, right? People honestly kind of take a perverse pleasure in sticking it to the landlord by not cleaning up by leaving damages, by making damages. You hear horror stories, or maybe you've experienced some of things. I don't want to say it. On, I, don't want to, I don't want to see it in the universe, but just like horror stories of things people have done out of spite. And frankly, landlords, almost like prison guards, feed into this by only coming to their community with sticks, right? When I was a renter in Austin, what I remember was getting $50 fines if I locked myself out of my apartment because I was dumb or something, right? So like, the only time you interact with people were often negative experiences and they wouldn't have carrots, they would only have sticks. So to your point, when I um, 
left uh, my role at Quality People, walked out to the parking lot and called one of my good friends and a continuing investor, a college buddy actually, um, he said, I had an idea just like that. And it, and it actually feels like I'm kind of the standard bearer for a lot of people who've had this frustration, this idea. And it's rare to be the guy that's like, I'm the one, you know, um, with the baton running the race on behalf of a lot of people. But it's true. Like there just honestly has to be at least a third option, which not only unlocks the um, wealth building potential for renters and can address affordability by giving them that cash that they can play with, um, but also... Uh, homeowners. A lot of people buy because they think it's dumb to rent. And it's not actually opportune for them to buy on a cycle where they're going to sell in a short cycle. Um, and I've done that. I was like, when, when I sold my company, I was committed to the parent company and bought a house near where the headquarters was going to be. And then a year or two later, I'm like, well, that was dumb, right? Like, I get why I did it. I wanted to show I was all in. I'm in this for the long term. And I respect that decision. But also, like, it's dumb to just buy houses capriciously. Um, and, um, and so I think there's a lot of people who, especially millennials, like people won't commit to a job for one to two years more than that. They're not going to commit to a, a city for more than one to two years now. Um, why would they buy a house when that possession will ultimately attempt to possess them? And that's the opposite of freedom. That's the opposite of power in the economy that you're now entrapped by this thing and the oddity that the driver of your net wealth, your investment happens to be where you choose to live. The probability that where you would put your money in a market-based decision is exactly where you choose to live, the probability that those two are the same is very unlikely. So it makes it an undiversified and high-risk investment when you look at it. If you give people a third option, live where you want and get a percentage that adds to an interest-bearing account that is relatively liquid and can diversify, uh, I think you get, you get interest from both parties, from, from homeowners, potential homeowners, and renters. I mean, it sounds fascinating. Um, I'm curious, you know, who owns the properties that are within this platform at this point? Um, you know, I, I want to really understand like the landlord tenant sort of dichotomy here and like if that goes away and really just how it works practically. Yeah. So I think this gets to some questions where you have like a vision of the future and when this industry takes root and you've got an established third way, what will it look like and what will operator roles be like? And it'll be dramatically different. But then you also have to find a way to get there in the current market dynamics, right? And, and create traction and survive and revenue and everything you need today. And so we started out in 2020. Um, I mean, the pandemic was a, a, a terrible um, a curse for a lot of people. I lost, um, you know, uh, certainly friends who lost loved ones and, uh, it was a very traumatizing period, but there were some strange, uh, you can find a silver lining if you look for it. Right. And for me, we were going to go hard on Viva. I actually coded the first version of our platform and, and pushed it live. Um, we were still in stealth cause I hadn't associated like this platform with like who's behind it. So kind of like floated the value prop, um, but kind of kept it semi stealth. In uh, January 1 of 2020, I literally posted it um, on the 31st, right before New Year's. And my family and I went and flew out to the Philippines, where my wife is from. Um, so I like posted my new startup, like made it live, sent it out to a bunch of people, got some feedback, and then went off grid for three weeks in the Philippines. Um, and when I came back and, and COVID started shutting everything down, I was grateful because we were going to go hard. We we're going to raise a bunch of money and, and run on an assumption that we would be the ones holding the portfolio of housing, right? That was our, our initial premise. Part of it was as we started talking to different people in the market, um, asset managers who hold lots of units, like a thousand plus units, um, mom and pop landlords. Most people were resistant initially because they wanted us to show them our portfolio. They were like, you show us yours and we'll show you ours. <laughs> and so we're like, fine, we'll build our own portfolio. And we ended up doing that. But the initial premise was to go that route. The problem is, of course, every hour that you're spending dealing with sewage or drainage is now you're not spending like building product and introducing it to market, right? I'm not being the Johnny Appleseed of, of rent rewards if I'm stuck holding too many liabilities, which sounds obvious. And I knew it was obvious from like a VC standpoint, but what we got as value was um, we got our hands dirty in, uh, in late 2020 and early 2021. We basically like put together our own portfolio of friends and family housing and, and managed it. It also meant we didn't have to build a shiny app 
um, from the get. We could kind of just like use existing tools and find out where the pain points are for managers. Um, and we learned a lot. So I think we speak better when we're talking to property managers and asset managers because we understand what they've gone through because we started with our own portfolio and then we we're able to say, look, here's the numbers. And these mentors we had who were LPs in other funds guided us to, to understand how to speak the language of the balance sheet and how to compare our balance sheet to these other operators and say, look, we've proven this model. If you offer people a carrot, they are super incentivized to get into your unit versus others in the area. So you're going to get lead gen, which again, you know, from my background, I'm all about lead gen. So you can go from like lead gen to wait list to people calling you saying, please, can I sign a lease? Even if you don't have a unit available, you're like, that's not legal, I think. But the idea is, um, you know, you create tremendous demand because you're offering something they can't get anywhere else. And then additionally, they're very grateful. They really are. We actually were worried about like, are people gonna like, you know, are we gonna have to like discipline people for not doing what we hope they, they will do uh, through this gamification system? In the end, they actually exceeded our expectations. They went out of their way to like protect the community if there was a safety issue. They went out of their way to like be resilient during drainage issues. They were super uh, uh, over the top to where we even started issuing like badges for going above and beyond, right? Um, not just meeting basic expectations. So I, I think it is true, obviously, um, with, with a smaller in sample size, you, you know, uh, you want to see this grow. But when people are given an opportunity to invest in their home and community, they're taking it and they're seizing it. Yeah, it's interesting to see that dynamic. I think I might have mentioned this to you before and some of the listeners have heard. But, you know, my first real estate investment was in a two unit building that had seven beds each and it was a frat house. And so my, my assumption at the time is like, if I take really good care of this frat house, the, these, you know, frat boys will do similarly. They'll take care of the property because they'll, they'll feel, you know, taken care of. And, you know, I think that's probably the reason that wasn't the case is probably part because they were frat fraternity college kids, but, um, it certainly was, we did well, but it was certainly a lot more work than even anticipated. And it's, it's interesting to see, you know, when they have this actual financial incentive that it truly is turning into care and um, being sort of respectful, treating it more like an owner. Um, I, I think it's, it's really interesting dynamic. Yeah. And, and, and they even have the option to put more money in if they want, because it is an interest bearing account. And some people are passionate to do so to, to see them seize the opportunity to get the concept. The funniest thing for me was thinking about like educating your renters and educating prospective renters. It turns out that we were able to use like a two line um, reference to Viva's model in the Google ad placements when we were testing our marketing and people would already come to the showing and tell the leasing agent, no, no, I get it. I get how Viva works. And they'll be calculating the benefit in their mind when factoring into their decision without support from our team. And I'm like, well, if they don't need us to tell them more and they get it that quickly, that's a sign that like this is ready and, and our, our consumer base is ready for this. Yeah. So let, let's say I'm someone looking for an apartment. I, I end up in one of your buildings. You know, what does that look like for me? What's the lease like that I'm signing? What portion of my rent goes into the fund? Yeah, exactly. As we've evolved, we've uh, naturally become asset light. We're a software layer. We're an amenity. We try to keep it simple. So you sign your lease. It's the same as any other lease. You enter into a terms of service with us like any other app. And basically what we've done is we've made it possible. And, and actually, we're a good broker because we're not your landlord. So you can kind of trust us, you know, not say better than your landlord, but better than your landlord. Um, and the idea is you're given a, a set of uh, gamified op uh, options, right? Like um, auto pay, set up rent as auto pay. So you can pay every month on time, right? With ease, verify that you have renter's insurance. Um, that's a big one. A lot of leases actually mandate renter's insurance, but they have no verification aspect. And then people complain when their stuff gets damaged from water penetration or something like that. So, um, so, so, um, you know, rent insurance verification, or, uh, you know, do you know where you're, uh, you know, take a picture of your main water cutoff valve. Because when the unit's flooding and they're freaking out, they're going to probably not be able to find it very quickly. And whoever it is that's supposed to be responsible for that unit is not going to be able to get there in time to help them, right? So those are some of the things we actually learned firsthand from being operators, right? And, and yeah. having a team that are all uh, uh, former and current landlords um, that, that helps us 
proactively service our customers. But yeah, you go in there and they're common sense things and you can make it fun. We've actually got some customers that are, are driving us to, to make the app maybe even a little bit cheeky. Um, so the way that I tend to operate, you mentioned the frat house, right? I would say that your challenge was you're the right premise. You went to like the toughest possible environment because that's where you were. <laughs> um, with Viva, we started with like um, mid market, but in um, outlying areas. So it's still serving a, a traditionally like uh, moderate income audience, but they're mostly like families, young families, not like we are looking at college housing now. So that'll be a different challenge, but we're very like right. thoughtful about like starting in the middle and, and taking on risk yeah. as we get more confident. Um, but yeah, I think people, people uh, like the sort of gamified aspect you come in and it should feel like fun and obvious. And like, you're learning things, you're doing the things that you need to do. One example I use, um, this applies to units that have garbage disposals. My wife actually, cause again, we had bought a, a second house actually when I, when I sold the company. And so she was getting used to that house and the garbage disposal stopped working and she called like a home warranty program and they were going to send someone. But then the operator's like, wait a second, um, actually, can you check underneath and find this reset button? Right. And she hit the reset button and it worked magically. And she educated the homeowner. Um, she spared the visit, saved 75 bucks and the labor and the, the gas and the environmental impact. And the time. Um, yeah. Exactly. Time. And that's the sort of thing we want to go after here is like, what are the things we can help you discover and learn and become aware of um, in terms of your responsibilities or options and skill sets that can make this place more profitable, honestly. Yeah, yeah I, I like the proactive nature of it. It's, it's something we're seeing some healthcare companies do as well, really focus on proactive healthcare. And I think it certainly applies to, to physical properties. Um, so I think it, it's really interesting to, to see how you're gamifying it, makes it really interesting to the tenant. Um, so are, are there any hard examples that you can give me in terms of like, my rent's a thousand dollars a month. Here's what I'm getting back. Yeah. So we, we did our 2021 pilots where we had a stake in the underlying assets or our partner had a stake in the underlying assets. Um, and we set that benchmark at 8% of cash back because we wanted to set a standard. We wanted to prove that real estate investors can make 15% IRR and the property management is profitable and the renters can get 8% cash back and it all makes sense, right? That the whole model works. And we have open sourced our, our 2021 pilot balance sheet to show this because we literally aren't hiding anything. Here's exactly the, the way the money breaks down. Um, at the same time, uh, so obviously a thousand bucks, that's 80 bucks a month. And then really about a month's rent by the end of your 12 months, if you, if you maximize the opportunity. Um, we also like that because if you look at the impact, it makes it massive. If instead of buying a house on a 30 year mortgage, you were to rent in our network for 30 years, at 8% of median rent, which um, in 2021 numbers was uh, $1,124. So we basically ran this model like if you are a median renter and you get 8% back, obviously that would increase somewhat over 30 years, but over 30 years of renting at median rate while getting 8% that then earns interest, you can build a quarter million dollars in net worth, which is more than the value of the unit you're probably living in, right? So you can like exceed what you might have in a mortgage context without ever holding debt and without ever committing to a place for more than a year in that, in that particular case. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that seems like incredible value proposition. I mean, the fact that the numbers all work from like the landlord perspective, that was certainly something I had questions about. So it, it's exciting to hear that that works. So if I'm understanding it correctly, the tenants, they'll receive this cash back while they're living in one of your units, but like they're not actually buying equity. If they leave, you know, they're not obviously getting any of those benefits anymore. Yeah, one of the things that a lot of people consider and we looked at, um, but we decided against is um, complicating the process by having these like transitory renters holding a stake in the underlying asset mm. that creates a lot of like needless um, uh, complexity and legal issues and, and, yeah. and risk in the asset. And then also would create a lot of friction with potential other B2B, you know, portfolio holders of, of apartments because now you're complicating um, the system. So we try to keep it simple, right? It's like, um, it, it's based off your performance. Uh, you get it in your fund. The fund is portable. Um, so we actually have people who've put money into a fund and aren't living in a unit. So they're basically just investors on our platform. We have people who are renting and they're building money in their platform. So they're like renters and investors. 
And then if people leave uh, to Wisconsin, recently we had someone that we don't have a unit there. Um, now they transition just being investors, but they're happy because that passive instrument has now built uh, interest bearing uh, uh, wealth that for them, we're actually get, we're, we're working to give them continued access to like, even if they're not investing in their underlying asset, they're still able to participate in real estate, um, real estate investments, which means that instead of the terrible, like less than one, or even with the current inflation, maybe 1% best case savings that they'll eventually see, um, or equity markets. I mean, if you want to try to be safe there, good luck getting two to 4%. And even then it's very risky, obviously crypto, totally different sector, but you know, with real estate, if you can get 8% plus, which is always set as a threshold. And again, as a real estate investor who knows real estate investors, we prefer 15% IRR, right? So if you can just yeah. give your residents access to 8% on their 8%, that's an insane return on value and they love it because they can't see that anywhere else in the market. Yeah, uh, I, I think it, it's great. And um, you mentioned you know, you're a software layer. So are you a, are there property management companies that are using the software layer or do you guys do the property management aspect as well? Yeah, I don't want to talk about doing the property management as well, because that was like a, a, uh, an era for a bygone era now, um, which was an interesting idea, but was very painful. Um, yeah, I've been there. I, I, I did property <laughs> management and it was not something I wanted to stay in. <laughs> exactly. So so respect to property managers out there. No, yeah, we, we have property managers sit in our software layer, but we actually integrate with their existing software. So if you look at the top three to five market leaders and property management software. We actually did an analysis of all the features of those software and Viva's offerings. They are not overlapping, so there's almost no redundancy. We let the software for property managers do all the things that they do. And then we ride on top of that as uh, almost a reporting layer and then the rewards layer. So we will work with um, Yardi and Trata, all the you know top five property management software. So we really are trying to almost add no additional manual overhead to the property manager. All they're getting is able to sit in an information layer that actually does something else we didn't even think about early on. We didn't realize that this is kind of revolutionary. If you're an asset manager with you know dozens of properties across multiple states, you're not going to be able to use one property manager for all of your properties in most cases. You're going to typically have multiple managers with multiple independent software choices that you as the asset manager have to kind of heard into some sort of coherent portfolio, we are a constant layer of information that analyzes those properties and merges with those softwares that shows you the occupancy of those properties, um, also broken down by floor plan, the uh, renewal rates of those properties, also broken down by floor plan, floor plan as well as um, the Viva score where they have the, the amenity rolled out that you can see here's the, the characteristics and the behavior of your community. Here's how your community is doing. And that is a uniform reporting layer that actually can train managers to pay attention to what they're not currently paying attention to. So, so we built a landlord CRM that actually solves a, a few interesting problems as an aside. It sounds like uh, incredible value add. Uh, definitely want to introduce you to some of the, the real estate people I work with and uh, see if we can maybe do something here. Yeah, it'd be great. Like I said, we're just out to we call ourselves kind of scientists. We don't have um, some of the fears or pressure that other founders have. Well, we're just out here. Yeah, we can definitely have a good life for ourselves. We're all investors and we're all going to be guaranteed to make more than enough money for our families. You know, we're here to build something that helps fix key problems in this marketplace and industry. And, you know, there's a lot of passion. I will say the one thing I was surprised about was how eager traditional uh, real estate folks are to hear and have these conversations. There was no gatekeeping. There was no like sharp elbows and um, you're not allowed in our club kid. Like people are very open to ideas. And I think it's because in this industry, it's very consistent. You're trying to turn capital into more capital and trying to turn something that's very hard to make a commodity, real estate, as much as possible into a commodity. And if you can find innovation and if you can get an edge that gives you advantage over your competitors, go for it. And we'd love to be that edge yeah. for for portfolio managers to catch on quick. So, Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I really respect what you're doing with Viva. I think it's really fascinating. I'm excited to personally learn more. Um, and, you know, obviously you've done some really cool things. We've talked about your journey, um, you know, in teaching, teacher talent, then going over to, to real estate. I think it's, it's a really fun journey. 
Um, but has along the way, has there been a story of when you really saw directly how your work was affecting change or kind of an epiphany moment? Yeah, I would say that I, I kind of, I won't go into a lane if I don't think there's a high probability, like a 90% probability of there being some kind of net net positive gain. And the part of the reason my life has involved these shifts is because I'm looking for an open lane. And when you find out that nonprofits have clogged lanes, which doesn't make sense, but it does, and local, state, and federal government have clogged lanes, that's where you end up in private sector where I am, right? And so one example is, you know, I really would have been happy being a teacher if I could have just taught what I thought students needed to know and not had to like meet the arbitrary demands of state testing regimes and the arbitrary demands of political and self-interested adults in the education system, right? That would have been enough to just to like educate families and see those kids, you know, become parents, become families and have this sort of wave effect. So I, I would have been satisfied if the system had, had kind of allowed me to do what I needed to do there. And, um, and that's partly why I left was to, was to, if not that system, housing has big effects on education as well. So they're correlated. Um, and with Viva, just a couple of examples, you know, the people who, first of all, would have not necessarily had a good home environment for their family at the particular time, and now have just had a better year of their life. Like that's already a reward that is memorable. And now that they've got resources and hope for their goals is memorable. And there's even um, some, some random things that happen. We had someone approach us um, that we're about to save from foreclosure because it turns out that um, they could convert their home from uh, uh, a foreclosure where they're at risk of losing their, their 65. They're trying to retire and they're a teacher aide and they might lose all of their family's net worth if they go through foreclosure. But if they convert it into a rental, there's kind of like a way where they can cash some of that equity, right? And put it into a fund and then be a renter who builds back wealth on top of their cashed out equity. So there's like some magical things that we'll, we'll share in the coming weeks yeah. with the press release and some other stuff that we couldn't have anticipated where it's like, if I save someone from losing their family's net worth in their lifetime, you know, I'm, I'm happy keeping wow. on this journey. So. Yeah, that, I mean, it, that's an incredible thing to be able to provide and excited to hear more about that as it moves forward. Yeah. So, do you have any experiences from childhood that really stuck with you that showed you the importance of giving back? Um, you know, I could ask this question a lot. Like, really, where did my values and desire to give back come from? I don't yeah. know. When you ask the question first, the thing that I think of most is that I really loved nature as a kid. I would just like wander off into national forests near where I lived. And I think natural systems are, um, are, are easy to understand. You don't have to like, you don't need an explanation to go observe nature. It just makes sense. And, and everything's very efficient. And I think as a kid, I would just come to social contexts and it just didn't seem, I think I was good to identify, like it wasn't necessary. All this conflict, all this suffering just didn't seem necessary. So I would just say that like, I guess maybe I was both extroverted enough to like get involved in contexts, but introverted enough to think deeply about what was going on. Um, I would say that I did this thing where if there was like negative emotions during the day, before I went to sleep, I would actually then unpack them all in a safe context and kind of like, sit with them long enough and even feel all the pain and tend to like break through to the other side with this realization that like, actually um, that suffering isn't going to necessarily set me back. It's not necessary. Maybe it's not even about me. And it kind of let you see these contexts in a way that was like, that's not necessary. You know, we don't have to be that way. So I think I was able to somehow escape a lot of the trauma of childhood and defer into my twenties um, through these kind of mechanisms that, that maybe, I don't, I don't know what it was, maybe led me to being very focused on, on other people and their well-being. Um, th there is a term, there is a term, um, and it's actually got two um, cultural references. One is a book called Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, which is a pretty well-known text. And the other is actually the Serenity movie, which is from the Firefly series. Um, if you've mm -hmm. seen it, it's a sci-fi. And yep. River Tam is like a, a, a troubled psychic who un doesn't understand why she's being traumatized in the movie, and she's actually feeling the pain and suffering of people a universe away, right? That had all um, struggled. And there's something to be said about this kind of you know, radical empathy, right? This idea that you're, I can't rest and just serve myself because I can't silence the awareness of, of needless suffering of others. And I think simply that's really um, what drives me to do what I do because 
for good, bad, or, or whatever, I just can't sit there and pretend to enjoy um, uh, personal gains if I'm not endeavoring to ease the suffering of others. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. Um, certainly feel similarly. And um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that helped you tremendously throughout your journey. Is there anyone or any few in particular that have been especially impactful mentors for you? When I say it helped me on my journey, th this is probably common. My wife is very helpful. She's uh, works. Uh, she was a teacher for I think 14 years against my seven um, and is still in education. And she's um, super consistent and creates that foundation of home and predictability and pays for health insurance when I've yet to resolve that as a startup founder um, and, and that sort of thing. And so I, I, I would say that like my home life being finding that piece of my puzzle to create stability at home is what allows me to take risks without them really being risks, without them being um, risks that create a, a deep anxiety and, and, and stress. Um, in terms of the journey, I have a great advisor and mentor. His name is Lee Jinx. He's a realtor and he is kind of the uh, uh, father figure, if you will, in a sense where um, he's also politically um, uh, originally sort of diametrically opposed to some of, of my thinking. And talking with him about Viva in the early days in maybe 2019 um, and even maybe before that and just having conversations with him, getting him to see and get sold on the prospect was one of the early victories that just said, OK, well, if somebody totally different, not in startups, not in entrepreneurship, who's a realtor, right, traditional role, you know, gets us and is fired up, then I've done something right. We've, we've converted a concept to another believer and he is our lead advisor and has been amazing. Um, and, and helping us achieve a lot of what we achieve. And there are other people like that, but I think those are two that I'll, I'll shout out right now. Awesome. Love that. It's, all, it's always great to see the types of people that, that help people along the way. Um, and if you'd like, you can ask me a question. Yes, I was curious. Um, what is, is there a project that is tempting for you, especially because it might create positive impact but would also involve risk and you're kind of like on the fence. Is there like an idea, even if it's like a moonshot or something that like you would love to go for if, if you felt the timing was right? Oh man, that, that's a tough one. I mean, there's, there's so many things out there that I would love to, to create impact around. I mean, I think the biggest struggle for me is just deciding where to focus my time and energy amongst all the so many things out there. Um, you know, in, in terms of particular areas, where I can be impactful, where uh, there might be a risky opportunity to take. I mean, it, I honestly don't know that I have a good answer to this because um, I just, I see a lot. Uh, I, I really wish I did. I, I, I knew, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll flip it and just give the first thing that comes okay. to mind. I've got, I've got a, a million bucks in one hand and a set of like three badass founders in the other. Uh, you get to tell them what they're going to take on as a problem for the next two years. Go. Okay. I mean, for me, uh, I'm a criminal justice reform person. So to me, I would put that money in those founders to improving our criminal justice system, to creating uh, just new ways to make it better. And, you know, there's a lot of great organizations out there that are working to reduce recidivism, to change the incentive models within our criminal justice system, um, to get people out of jail that don't belong there. So Really, I would likely take those uh, entrepreneurs that you mentioned and just determine how can this group be most impactful in making our criminal justice system better. That's awesome. Right. I, I look forward to a future where I have the resources to just start like, you know, funding more, you know, diverse teams pursuing impact ventures like that. So that's, that's great. Yeah. No, I, I love that. I think it's a it's a really great perspective. I, I was talking to a friend a, a couple months ago about um you know, there's so many people out there that are incredible problem solvers, but they don't necessarily know how to scale their work or they, they don't know how to implement it in a, you know, organized fashion. And so he, he was, just, we were just sort of spitballing the idea of uh, a fund for basically to, for nerd solving problems was kind of the way we put it. And uh, it's such an exciting thing to imagine. And I, you know, there's all a, there's a lot in our society people talking about like is capitalism good or bad there's all these people with all this power but my hope is that you know the people like us that are thinking about 
using their resources to solve problems do get access to those resources so that we can do things like that. I'll, I'll say, actually, you brought up a good point, which is key to my entire journey, which is um, I was skeptical of capitalism, certainly as a young person and had, I think it's in your notes, contemplated a vow of poverty until I realized that actually poverty is an inescapable condition, like it, it, by definition, um, if you can get out of it, you're not poor anymore. Um, and I was just choosing to be broke. Um, so it's almost an insult to poverty to say, like, I'm going to take a vow of poverty, in my opinion, not not in terms of like the religious tradition, but as just a, a teacher. Um, but I, I say this because um, I call it capitalism 2.0, right? I do think that what we have a deficit of in America is like leaders who push to be truly exceptional and like continue to push their standard. And we've got a lot of people who are celebrated as heroes because they made a lot of money, right? But we know that they probably didn't prioritize the stakeholders they should have prioritized, right, in making money. And there's a lot of models that are legalized and successful that are ultimately parasitic, right? Um, and so, and again, I could spend a career like muckraking and pointing out how awful they are, but I'd rather provide a counterexample because I think we can. I think we can, and I see it every day with lots of founders, not just me. We can seed better models that prioritize stakeholders and create net positive returns to perpetuate the model through capitalism, right? And what that creates is, I think, an infinite growth horizon. Because if there's no gotcha, if there's no scam to unearth, if it's if it's transparent and on face a value for all stakeholders, then what's there to tear it down? And so I think even though some of these companies have succeeded and you know cashed in on, on ill-gotten gains, they were volatile, right? They were discovered, people rebelled, people can be awakened as consumers, even if not yet to understand those harms. And there can be this roller coaster where you take them down to an extent, but alternatively, if you just build a model that serves stakeholders transparently and, and reasonably, um, then it has a growth horizon that shouldn't be interrupted. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. Let's do it. That sounds sounds great to me. And um, so, if everything ended tomorrow, you know, aside from your family, what would you be most proud of? Just that I had the courage to identify the thing that I wanted to do, but might have fear or anxiety around, create a startup, create a family, right? Go get my PhD, whatever it is. Um, and that I tried to the best of my ability to just go do that, right? To, to live freely and wholly and put it all out there and, um, and not leave anything left. I don't think, when I was in cross country uh, as, a, as a high schooler, I, um, would run and run and run and run. I would get better every race because by the end of the race, when I like collapsed across the finish line, um, I would realize I still had a little bit of energy left. Like even in the act of like being able to like complain about how tired I was or to, you know, exclaim anything, I still had some energy, which meant I could have put a little bit more into my effort. And I felt the same way as a teacher when I had kids. I was like, I love my own children so much. Now that I understand that, could I have done more for the kids that weren't mine? Now that I even understand how much you can care about someone, could I have given more as a teacher? And I think the goal is to try and avoid that to the extent possible, make peace with it, but also try to give as much as you can in the time you have and, and then have no regrets. And then, yeah, then you've done, you've done your best. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that a lot. I think even just that perspective of like, could I have done more? Um, it's an interesting one and, and one that you always want to try to say no to. With founders and nonprofits, I, I tend to say I give until it hurts. Um, and thankfully, yep. I'm in a position privilege where now I can give a lot more until it hurts um, and probably even more right, than I realize. Right. So if you could snap your fingers and fix one thing in the world, what would it be? And how do you think that change would reverberate? I think if I could make everyone feel like River Tamfelt in Serenity, the movie, um, or the lead character in Parable of the Sower, um, that might be a little extreme, right? That'd be like turning on the volume and everyone's like tortured by the suffering of others. Um, maybe maybe give them a knob where they could tone it down a bit. Um, maybe not. Um, but I think just understanding and thinking of others first before you think of self, right? And not being able to tune out. Yeah, start dialing up empathy, right? To if, if they couldn't handle a 10, at least an eight. Um, and, uh, and I think then people wouldn't be able to ignore uh, and silence those voices and, and try to make, peace with their um, compromises and concessions, especially as leaders. I think I hold people who advocate for themselves as being bosses and leaders and title holders be in, in, a, in, a, in an accountable category. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's 
a, a really good perspective in terms of you know people not being able to make some of the decisions that they do right now because they have that empathy. Um, reminds me of a recent podcast podcast guest, Todd Rose, in his book Collective Illusions. He talks about you know congruence and how people if they they might have these morals, but if they start to slightly bend them, slowly they're going to tell themselves that it was the right thing and they're going to change the way that they act in general. So it's important to have that perspective and that empathy in this case. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a slippery slope. And I think that's anytime I've had to leave a system, it's because I think I was um, not sure that staying in that system would, uh, would eventually erode my own ability to be an agent for good. Right. You know, it's been, it's been awesome talking to you and learning all about your path and, um, your perspective on the world. Um, I, I think that a lot of us, a lot of the listeners will be inspired. How can people support you and your impact? Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, will encourage everyone to reach out. Um, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. I'm Dr. Michael Barnes, mostly because then when I get spammed, it, it feeds the doctor. So I know it was spam. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm easy to find. Uh, I think my uh, personal uh, profile there is slash text Barnes, T-E-X. B-A-R-N-E-S. Um, and from there, uh, it's an easy way to connect. And then I can follow up people, have meetings, emails, that sort of thing. Um, you can also email pretty much anything at viva.fund and you'll get me because they all redirect to my email um, or michael at viva.fund. I'll go ahead and throw it out there. Um, but the idea is um, definitely love to connect with people, even if asynchronously, right? Even if I don't get a chance to meet with someone, um, becoming aware of what they're doing and seeing opportunities to connect pieces I like to say, and you probably see this in your in your network, that all of your relationships, you're not going to be able to like maximize utility of all of your relationships all at once for yourself. That doesn't make sense. That's not possible. And I call those kind of like trust bridges and you want to keep the bridge warm. So if I can connect somebody in my network to someone else in my network, that actually keeps all those relationship you know, bridges uh, warm and ready and it makes it better for me and for them and for everyone. So I love to connect people and and also, again, to be a resource whenever possible. Uh, to give a half hour or an hour of my time, even if it hurts sometimes um, for the benefit of others. So I, I can certainly appreciate that. And uh, thank you so much for your time and for sharing uh, all these details with us. Um, I'm excited to continue our conversation and uh, look forward to how Viva and your other endeavors evolve. Yes, yeah, excited to continue to be a relationship and, and look forward to opportunities to work together. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for listening to this episode of People Are The Answer. To find out more, go to peoplearetheanswer.com.